The date is June 19, 2004. The pallet hand that you see before you belongs to a young man named Brock Huck Brown. He has just pressed a small red button on a borrowed video camera. He is about to direct his very first short film, and he's trying to project an air of quiet confidence. All of this is true, except for one fact. This is not his first short film. Is this his first short film? Entitled Marshmallow Vader, it combined bootlegged explosions, black trash bags, and two brothers sword fighting. Or perhaps this strange film. Two brothers fighting in a manner which seems to foreshadow Christopher Nolan's inception until a random skateboarder interrupts mid-shot. Could it be this film? Entitled Skateboard Ninjas, it combines skateboarding, outrageous racial stereotypes, and brothers fighting. We cannot know. This is an examination of a filmmaker, so let's begin. If Brock had one talent, one skill, it was this. He could turn this into this. This blank page that crushes the will of weaker men into this. You are looking at the 24 short film screenplays that he wrote or co-wrote. These are the ones we know about. There are likely many more. But these short screenplays were just for amusement, something to do to pass time before breakfast. Here we have his feature screenplays, Last Rites with Johnny Bosco, The Madcap Armament, Sin of the Opiate, Documenting Ambler, and Airlift, five feature screenplays written in five short years. Brock described his tone as wry, mocking, self-deprecating. Let's examine this point further using a few examples. Dixie sits on a patio. An unseen man approaches and offers her a cigarette. Dixie looks the other way, produces a massive cigar, gnaws on it, and scowls. Manny steadies himself in the corner of the ring. An announcer runs down the bout. Manny turns and walks steadily to the center of the ring, unaware of the cheering throngs. He smiles a sick smile. Shane huddles against the wall of a steel gray corridor, restringing the guitar in his hands. A voice echoes down the hallway. He mumbles to himself and pulls his hood over his head, turning his back so as to hide. The elevator dings open. Shaw steps out merrily, whistling to himself. Standing against the wall is Rupert, seedy, gangly, matter of fact. He's like a molester at a carnival, eyeing Shaw greedily. Inside the animal's den, Winston aims his gun and finds nothing. Then he looks down and sees a small animal cracker on the jungle floor. It is a tiger cracker. The cracker stands there, stoic, its eyes focused upon Winston. Winston glares at the cracker. Then he whimpers and falls down on his knees beside the cracker. Sniffling, Winston sets his gun aside and weeps. Then he pulls a canteen off his belt, opens it, and dips the animal cracker in milk. He takes a bite in between sobs. Now we find ourselves back where we started, a white room and a couch. It is a good place to observe the director at his work. Here he pours over his script, not wanting to miss any detail, and perhaps a bit confused. In this clip, he discusses character motivation with an actor while a small chicken cavorts near the camera. In this brief glimpse, he fraternizes with the dregs of society, a pantomime. Here he is seen from overhead. If the atmosphere on his sets could be described in one word, it would be this, dour. Here he debates the finer points of killing and being killed. Here he identifies a mark for an actor. In this scene, he is forced to perform a task beneath an artist of his caliber, plotting out complex camera movements for his jungle epic.
Brock was never an actor by choice, but often one by necessity. Sometimes, this was in the form of cameos, like a disturbed boy, an oblivious waiter, or a masked gunman. More often than not, when he acted, he was the leading man. A director himself, he was no stranger to the subtle characterizations he looked for in actors, and he brought this to life in his roles. In this epic biotech thriller shot in a library, he plays a small man adrift in a large corporation. Observe as he claws at his data allotment. Here, disgust at wasteful corporate procedures. And here, acting in a bathroom stall. In this film, he is a lowly printer, harassed by corrupt law enforcement. He seems at first defeated, but later defiant. In this film, a simple man trapped in a complex predicament. Watch as he is drawn to an unfortunate corpse. Here, in a moment of despair, he utters a mild profanity. Here, he repeats himself to make a dramatic point. Look. I mean, look. She doesn't have to be here. That's, that's Yet, great. there was one role that he was born to play. Himself. In this film, he plays a director who fails miserably in his filmmaking attempts and must justify his efforts to his close friends. Enraged, he attempts to destroy any objects that stand in his way. He would deny any assertion that he enjoyed his roles as an actor, but this evidence would indicate otherwise. Convention would tell us that this is the part of the film where we examine the filmmaker as a friend, waxing nostalgic about the memories we made together. But isn't that what this has been about all along? What is filmmaking but something for friends to do together? And to leave behind pictures and sounds to remember in the years to come. Do you remember where we started and how we had to go back further to find the real start of our story? It appeared as though we had found the truth, but we hadn't. To find the true start, we need to go all the way back. The year is 1985 and Brock is two years old. In his hands, a toy, a red baseball bat. But in his mind, Brock H. Brown is making his very first film. Strange